Welcome to Eat, Drink, Think. I'm Amy O'Neill Hauck. In this podcast from Edible Communities, a network of magazines published in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, we celebrate all things local and sustainable in the food world. Today, we're speaking with Chloe Servino. Chloe leads food and agriculture coverage for Forbes magazine, and she's spent time on what she calls the billionaire beat. Nearly a decade of reporting at Forbes has brought her to In-N-Out Burger's secret test kitchen, drought-ridden farms in California's Central Valley, burnt-out national forests logged by a timber billionaire, and a century-old slaughterhouse business in Omaha. She serves as a steward on the Forbes Union Unit Council. Her work has also been featured in the Los Angeles Times, NPR, Fast Company, and the Financial Times. Armed with the access she's gained over the years as a journalist and with her deft skills as a researcher and synthesizer of raw data, Chloe crafted the new book, Raw Deal, Hidden Corruption, Corporate Greed, and the Fight for the Future of Meat, out late last year from Simon & Schuster. In Raw Deal, she catalogs the consolidation and power of the meat industry and the backroom dealings behind it while talking with experts and those affected firsthand by working in and living near feedlots and slaughterhouses. She draws out the connections between meat production, industrial agriculture, and the climate crisis, and she makes the case for urgent, systematic change. She also dives into the fermentation vats and other new realities of high-tech food as the rush to create new climate-supportive ways to eat merges with the gold rush mentality of venture capitalists. Chloe, welcome to Eat, Drink, Think. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. That was awesome. Well, like the rest of us, you have to eat a few times a day. It seems like while you're a person who leans toward plant foods, you're adventurous enough to try whatever you're served in the service of being a good guest and in service of your writing. Can you share some of the more interesting things you've eaten for the book or for your stories? Oh, absolutely. I love that question. Thank you so much for it, because I truly do have this kind of supersize me mentality uh, when I'm doing reporting. But really, it's just because... Uh, being a journalist is all about getting trust from who you're speaking with. And I think there's no better way to do that than eating the same food that they want to eat. And so I really, you know, from some of the fast food tastings that I've done over the years, you know, trying out new products at Arby's, you know, as I was trying to court this private equity billionaire white whale, who's rolling up a bunch of the different fast food brands in the country to, you know, I've done a three and a half hour mozzarella tasting with the largest secretive, wow. this the, the largest mozzarella maker in the country and also the largest way maker and kind of lactose intolerant. <laughs> so I was stuffing a lot of the lactate pills and stuff in my body, taking shots of whey, eating all the different pizzas. They make all the pizza cheese, the pretty much invented pizza cheese. I, I ate a a tomahawk steak fresh off the line in Omaha for this book. And one of of the folks who've been reading it, one of the favorite anecdotes I've been hearing about is this scene in the steakhouse in Nebraska where I'm with the billionaire and a bunch of his slaughterhouse guys. And I'm the only one really who's able to finish the steak. And I did that because I had to. My reputation was pretty much on the line, especially after the waiter had handed me the tomahawk and everyone at the table got their own tomahawk. And he looked at me and said, Little lady, are you going to be able to finish that? Oh, you got little ladied. <laughs> oh, I got little ladied. And I had to then, at that point, eat all this. Like, I've never eaten a, a steak that size ever again. But, oh, wow, it was buttery and fantastic. You know, everything in between. I had some of the best broth of my life while reporting this book via Cook's Venture. They had been doing these tests on how to add sorghum and wheat and different types of crop rotations into the feed that they were sourcing locally. And I ended up doing a marathon day of cooking each of them to see how, you know, the wheat especially was showcasing and how it was changing the taste. I mean, you really did taste the difference, but let me tell you also the broth after that was some of the best stock I've truly ever had. Such life affirming, life giving broth stuff. Wow. Liquid gold and everything between me. I started out as a kid doing a lot of gardening, but also was doing a lot of club sports and was nicknamed Mickey D's. (laughs) my club team because I was eating too many McNuggets in between tournament games. And so I've really seen the gamut of this food system. Um, but now, you know, I'm growing mushrooms in our apartment often in New York city. I have a small terrace garden where I'm 
trying to add to what we do as much as possible where herb, you know, worms are in the compost and then that's feeding my herbs and my lettuces and then some are the tomatoes and zucchinis and other things that I'm trying to grow and fighting the rats day and day to do. Um, but I'm a very curious eater and I think eating is a way that I, um, experience my curiosity in general. Right. And speaking about what you eat, you share aloud some of your food concerns, which are aligned with those of other privileged eaters in the country hoping to do the right thing about our food buying and eating choices. But also you talk to chef Sophia Rowe about embracing nuance and rejecting dogma when it comes to day to day evening eating. I'm sorry, when it comes to day to day eating. And you quote her saying, there's no such thing as good or bad food when you're starving. You found some liberation in her takes on tackling tough problems while remaining sane about eating. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. She gave me and so many other folks who really respect what she does every day, this freedom, because it's become so didactic, so almost violent at times on social media, even you have to be one or the other, when in reality, life's very gray and yes, there is a way that voting with your dollars can matter, but we've really been beaten over the heads with this concept. And at the end of the day, our $1 has so much less bearing than it does for that billionaire. You know, and there's a handful of billionaires and a few small corporations that really dictate what we have access to in the first place. And that's really what we need to be refocusing this guilty atmosphere on the, there's too much guilt put on consumers and there's so much insecurity and food waste and, and hunger in this country. That was just such a, it, it's, it's horrifying to, to understand how deep and how structural it really is and how it really could be fixed. And so, you know, I really appreciate Sophia Rowe talking about how it's not just about acai bowls that are being imported from the Amazon and, you know, with a lot of plastic, um, you know, it's about how much, you know, there is way too much meat being consumed around the world, especially in America. And while factory farming really needs to come to an end and we have to really completely change how meat is made, there is a place for actual scientifically basic rotational grazing, um, adapted moving through different fields. And there are some land really that has been so degraded through monoculture and pollution and industrial farming that they really wouldn't be able to produce food without some of this, you know, hooves and manure and these natural processes. And so, you know, again, I think what we have are the classic meat and potatoes meal or, um, you know, meat heavy meals every day. That's something that's really not going to be part of the future, but it's really about how do we all get there together and how do we you know, take the blame off of each other? Mm hmm. Early in your book, you quote Temple Grandin, one of the world's experts on sustainable slaughter, saying something I heard her repeat at a keynote in Edible Communities Annual Edible Institute this fall. She said, big is not bad, big is fragile. And yet your book outlines and illustrates the major downsides of big when it comes to our food system, including near monopolies among producers and a new term to me, monopsonies when it comes to buyers big can be bad if it's corrupt. Can you talk a little bit about the corruption in the meat market? And if you think Temple is right, can there be big without bad? Yeah, I so love that quote. I'm glad that she's, you know, keeping this message out there. She really came to that from these organic conversations that I was having as I was in New York, walking around the couch in my apartment through like the, really the pandemic's darkest days and us, me asking her some of these big questions and these were her answers. The big is not bad. It's fragile. And, you know, well, I think, uh, I think maybe she and I will differ on, on how big, um, will be maintained in the, in the future. I also do agree that there's unfortunately not enough time to start from scratch. The climate crisis is here. It's only getting worse. And we right now don't have enough time, resources, or capital, you know, to really completely, build entirely new supply chains, entirely new plants. And so there will be a place for big in the future, but it has to work a completely differently as I was talking about, but also be within these regional systems that really need to be way better supported. I want to see 
completely different regional infrastructure that, you know, big corporations have gutted from local communities over the past, you know, five decades. And so, you know, Temple comes from that interesting part of Colorado where JBS has created a massive foothold. And there's a lot of different types of corruption in the book and different lawsuits and allegations of price fixing and really, you know, horrible violations of, you know, human rights and other worker abuses. But when you talk about, you know, the kind of hidden corruption that a lot of the book is, is, is focused on, it comes back to JBS and this wild saga of these billionaire brothers trying to turn their small family butcher into this massive global operation. And that's exactly what they did. They're now billionaires. They now have, you know, control over the world's largest meat company. And they've been doing that as their meat has been tied to deforestation in the Amazon. Lots of other pollution and worker abuses and issues in, in the U.S. But then also the actual funds that were used to acquire iconic assets in the U.S. and kind of take over the U.S. meat industry becomes such an entrenched player that's now almost impossible to extricate out from it. It was a lot of it through preferential treatment to different loan officers, gotten through bribes and kickbacks, a massive kickback and bribery scheme that had so many different forms and different politicians that were being paid off that only at one part of it even touched three different presidents in Brazil. And so the book goes into, you know, how this bribery scheme really worked, how it was directly used to acquire distressed assets in the U.S. that because the U.S. meat market was already so consolidated, there really weren't enough other buyers to begin with. And so it made it extremely vulnerable. So when you talk about big is bad, we have this massive consolidation, right? And JBS was able to actually, you know, kind of exploit that and target because of how consolidated it already become and how the cons American consumer and American regulators and bankers and loan officers and farmers and the entire system were already structurally being built around only supporting those and, and, and pushing out these smaller players and, and smaller infrastructure, regional infrastructure, canneries, you know, uh, hugely important, you know, parts of this country that could really take hold mm -hmm. if we if were able to invest in it now. Hmm. And have you heard reactions to your book from folks inside the meat industry or maybe the Department of Ag? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been a great reaction, honestly. I mean, I was not you know, trying to be the most media shut in, you know, writer shut in person possible, but I expect for the worst, hope for the best. I mean, it was very intense process to, to go through. And I wanted to make sure these, the standards of this book were extremely high. And so I spent a lot of time off the record with a lot of people inside these industries and I've heard no complaints. I had though some, some amazing, some amazing reactions. I got an email actually last week while I was on a reporting trip from a farmer who had actually successfully transitioned his farm to his son. And he told me that he had actually had read it twice. That's how much he liked it. And so I was like, wow. That's great. Yeah. And it's, it's riveting in, in the detail and the scenes about the corruption and, and what's happening with the planet. And it's also just so rich in data and detail. So I think that it's, probably appeals well to both, you know, nerds and, and foodies alike. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a investigative mm -hmm. journalist through and through as for the JBS stuff alone. I spent months just in document land, digging very deeply into thousands and thousands of pages of different lawsuits and testimony to investigators or reading the, you know, government reports in Brazil and in the U.S., talking with these lawyers, talking to the folks who actually were hot on the trail to figure out this bribery saga to begin with. And again, that's only part of the JBS stuff. There's a lot of different price fixing allegations and worker abuses that I also felt deserved a lot of time. And so most of, of, of the past two years that it took to write this book were spent just deep, deeply investigating. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the book, you discuss a lesser known middleman in the food system, contract food manufacturers. 
And some of those producers got extra attention recently due to the discovery that they're employing underage immigrant workers. At the same time in Minnesota and Iowa, there's a push to lower age minimums for young workers instead of increasing protections for minors. Do you think corporate reliance on these contractors will shift with this attention? I think that was a huge embarrassment, but unfortunately, this is an extreme example of how hidden these workers are, and that's by design, because there are problematic or sketchy or potentially dangerous things happening in many of these plants. I get you know, the alerts about the amputations or the folks falling into vats constantly, and a lot of the children that were part of this big reveal actually even were found to be working in JBS plants. And I found it very notable that the government, as they were investigating, you know, kind of took the blame off these corporate actors, which would have been seeing very small, you know, young children in these plants working multiple shifts. I mean, this was not a one-time deal. These were, you know, long-term contractors. And I think that is uh, unfortunately just how the, these regulations and government works hand in hand with the meat industry because at the end of the day, all they really want is continued access to the cheapest meat possible. And they're going to turn away at these abuses or the environmental degradation because simply that's all they care about. Yeah, it is so challenging for me as a parent to see these children, you know, not only in the work that they've been forced to do, but then once the light is shined on them, they're in a different kind of danger all of a sudden because of their immigration status. And instead of people kind of swooping in and caring for them now, you know, they're at risk in another way. Yeah, let's talk about the immigration aspect of the meat industry. The meat industry pays some of the lowest wages in this country and target some of the most vulnerable workers in this country, immigrants, refugees, people of color, people who may be very fresh in this country, have nowhere else seemingly to turn or, you know, again, they many times are being targeted. Part of this book went into very little known allegations of wage subjugation and worker manipulation financially to keep these very vulnerable workers at some of the lowest paying jobs because they found the labor force to be the only way that they could continue to keep their profit margins high, which is, again, absurd. And it became a crazy scheme where executives were, you know, meeting in Florida and deciding they wanted to go on dolphin boat cruises to discuss this scheme or tiki, tiki drink experiences. And the difference between the white collar workers and, you know, the workers who are really shoulder to shoulder on the line can't be understated. And that also is separated out in the plants for a reason. Now, again, this is nothing that, you know, the average American consumer is, is seeing, but let's take it a step further because there are so many different hidden dangers in these plants, not only financial subjugation, but also just actual violence. I write a lot about human rights abuses, racism, um, you know, systemic issues, sexual harassment. Um, but then there's also even other hidden costs that I uncovered through this research. Probably one of the craziest ones that I never even really understood is that, you know, talk about these children, right? They're so young. They have they're not adults. They, they, they really can't make the decision to work in these plants for themselves. And they could get a superbug just from one shift. Now, now this gets into the whole antibiotic resistance question. But when I found out that any single worker on one shift or taking a job for one summer or one transitory period of trying to get their feet in America on a steady footing, they could get a superbug. And, you know, what that really means is it could exist inside of them forever. They may never end up having that ignite, but it also could ignite in a few weeks, in a few days, or in a few years or a few decades, and they could get pneumonia or another disease later on. And then all of a sudden that inflammation ignites this superbug. And then all of a sudden they have an antibiotic resistant disease that often craters very quickly. And this is just another way that workers in this meat industry are being hurt and it's very little tracked. And you even mentioned hunger as one of the problems. I know you profiled somebody who said, you know, I can't afford the chicken that I'm creating here. 
I would love to talk about that actually, because that interview really has stuck with me ever since I did it. You know, it was in March of 2020 and I actually had the great excitement and, and joy to actually meet Michael Foster this past weekend at South by Southwest um, after. So I'll, I'll go back. But, you know, I, I had reached out to him. He was at a Wayne Farms plant that did not have PPE, had saran wrap dividers these folks were still completely shoulder to shoulder on the line. No one was taking care. No one was, no one was taking any precautions whatsoever. And these workers were then being pushed to stay on the line working, even if they were sick. And so I did an interview with Michael Foster, who his mom had worked at that chicken plant and was actually after many, many years, only given $300 as, as, as a, as a thank you. And he had worked in that plant for years and years and had only made $11 an hour. And he had this very visceral interview that we did over zoom and it was right in front of his house. And he wanted to do it there because he wanted to show people where he lived. And he wanted to say that he felt so honored that, you know, workers were feeling that were being told they were essential, but also that's not how they were being treated. They were being treated the exact opposite. And when he said that we're day in, day out on the line, but we don't have chicken in our freezers right now. And our company didn't even have the decency to offer to give us chicken for our freezers and our freezers are empty. I mean, that just, it, it, it shaped every single interview I did, you know, um, since then and continues to, um, and, you know, it, it was really powerful. You know, I, I met him this past weekend and actually really had never had the full understanding of how actually impactful that interview publishing was. But, you know, the president of the, of the union where he was represented, you know, told me that that actual interview saved lives. And they were on stage talking about how that specific interview the next day, there was PPE rolling out. There were masks being handed out. The saran wrap was going down. There was temperatures being checked. And that was the first time in the many weeks of the pandemic mm -hmm. that that actually was happening. And so, I mean, just uh, unless these plants have a light being shown on them, they're doing dark things. And it takes heroes like Michael Foster to stand up and speak up and not be afraid of whatever retribution there could be. And there was retribution. He ended up having to leave the mm -hmm. plant. Now he actually works for the union broadly and was actually down in Bessemer for a really long time just with his daughter, just trying to be at that stoplight. Amazon was trying to move and, uh, you know, trying to get in touch with any workers who wanted support any way they could. So the story of Michael Foster, unfortunately, was a horrible pattern and poultry workers and, and meat planting workers in particular, especially in the plants that aren't unionized, have some of the lowest you know, salaries and, and benefits of, of any profession. And these are very skilled jobs. The industry likes to think about sometimes, you know, sometimes trying to think, make people think that they are not skilled. Jobs. These are extremely, extremely skilled jobs. Do you have a sense for the percentage of um, these slaughterhouses that are union represented? Yeah, so it's biggest in beef, and then it goes to pork. Chicken is the least unionized and the worst, I believe it's around a third of all chicken. I think UFCW does around 80 or 70 percent of beef and pork or so. So it's a majority of those plants and, and chicken. It's it's a bit less. And it really, again, depends on what type of company it is and how they're owned and the whole thing. Mm. I'm going to shift our thinking a minute towards the climate. I recently had journalist Tamar Haspel here on Eat, Drink, Think, and she's particularly skeptical of food miles as a driver of climate change. Tamar says there might be lots mm. of reasons to eat local, but the climate isn't necessarily one of them. And you say something similar in your book, and I quote, local meat isn't always better for the environment, nor is it always ethically superior. But you go on to say, it is important to invest in food distribution that has the shortest distance to reach us at home from the farm. Can you talk a bit about the reasons behind that? Absolutely. Yeah, tomorrow is wonderful. And I think there's real value in that, not just from the environment, but also from the worker's perspective. But a small farm might be struggling far more than 
farm that, you know, has long-term contracts with a, the big firm or um, something that's more in the industrial supply chain, simply because those are the types of farms that, you know, have been squeezed out over time. And it's a hard business that they're in and it's structurally stacked against the organic or the local or the regional folks. And so I really wanted to write in the book about why local is best supported from like the financial perspective and the structural perspective in that way, because, you know, I'm, I'm turning 30 this year, I'm young and there has been a decade plus of a lot of excitement around local food and farmers markets, but it's also been extremely disappointing. And I, I want to see more acknowledgement of that kind of culpability because there's been, you said it earlier, a lot of privilege put into, you know, folks thinking that, you know, just going to a farmer's market every once in a while is enough. And we really need to do a better job of taking a more active and real role in the food system or else it's not going to scale. I mean, there's a reason that local food is just such a tiny, tiny percentage of the total food that's produced in this country. And so I think that's like, has, just has to be acknowledged from like that perspective because these are all businesses. And while there are such a great business case for making sustainable solutions and that being best for the business long-term, it also takes a lot to make those decisions and it takes a lot to get there. Otherwise, you know, I think there are just simply ways that because of the way subsidies work, because of the way regulations work, that some of the centralization of big food can do a better job. I'm not saying they actually do, but they potentially could. And I'm hoping that's kind of what we're able to eventually, you know, tap into on a more like, democratic basis. Mm -hmm. You say our power as consumers is remembering that food, drinks, wine, grain, alcohol, weed, all of it comes from the ground. This is in the context of high-tech meat replacements and their lack of transparency about sourcing. How does remaining connected to where our food comes from give us power? Because Americans have no idea where their meat comes from, and that's exactly how it's hurting us. And it's also making others rich, and it's not going to stop until we have a deep understanding of how we've been swindled in this way. And I think there's also a lot of privilege and to be able to take the time and effort in understanding where food comes from. But, you know, it could be as simple as joining a CSA or joining a co-op, obviously there's a far like more expansive or you're, there's, there's so many different ways to go with this. A great one is I think also, you know, running for a local school board to try to in influence institutional purchasing for public school lunches or public hospitals or public nursing homes purchase. That's a huge, huge, huge amount of dollars that are spent that right now is only going to industrial food because it's just centralized. It's easiest, it's cheapest. And that's, that's how they've always done it. And there's just been this concerted effort over the past 60 years as corporate control and consolidation and people have become billionaires from our food system and profiting off of it that they've also eclipsed and tried to hide how bad monoculture has made our soils, how much water has been pollution, polluted because of industrial row crop farming and synthetic agriculture. And we're simply never going to be able to combat it without remembering and, and also reframing our expectations because of that. You know, I, I don't like apple season for my CSA. I wish I lived in Florida and could have access to pineapples and mangoes, you know, when I get that fourth bag of apples, I, I'm like, help me someone, please. But, you know, at the same time, I try to actively reframe for myself constantly that this is where you live. This is what you can have access to. This is what you've already paid for. This is what your farmer is expecting. And you don't need more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought about that idea of enough a lot while I was reading. And scale was something I thought about too, because as you tell it, the giant corporate food system so often comes across as rife with dangers to the mere humans in its wake. And when it comes to solutions, you offer up the idea of re-regionalization. Can you talk us through the benefits of a complex regional food web and any of the examples that you explored? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think re-regionalizing the food system is a way to ensure that communities can survive crisis and climate crisis in particular in dignity because at the end of the day i've spoken with the billionaires they've told me when it's raining gold outside it's we're walking around with buckets and they're not going to be the ones to save you 
On top of that, this actual just back to the biggest fragile point, the consolidation is going to have massive climate bottlenecks. There will be floods. There will be extreme weather events that take out some plants that at the end of the day will impact how people get food. Again, when there's already so much a food waste, but also hunger based around access, not just insecurity. It's really an access problem. And so I talk about re-regionalizing the food system because there used to be this amazing network of canneries and local plants and different ways to preserve, but preserving that gives a little bit more convenience, but not this insane convenience that we've begun to expect um, that's like led to that overabundance you see in grocery stores. Um, You know, I think when you talk about local meat in particular, these farmers and ranchers are working so hard just to get this amazing product done right and farmed right and, and packaged right that they often don't want to do much more to it. But if we could just have that next step of processing, you know, have the local hunter, or the, you know, the deer producer able to, you know, get a sausage made or have access to more communal infrastructure like that can be super powerful. And we'll lend resilience, we'll lend access. I mean, I write a lot about too how we don't have universal food access in this country, which is insane, especially when we have universal health care and universal, you know, access to energy, but an education. Um, but you know, we we don't have universal access to food in a public food sector. It could work very much within the system of market demand. Unfortunately, you know, we're in this late capitalistic system where we don't really have time to create an entirely new situation. We have to work as quickly as possible within the confines of how these markets already work. But universal food access, a public food sector could add a different way of, of purchasing, balance out that imbalance power from these billionaire backed meat packers that are amassing so many profits. And at the same time, it would empower regional producers and folks like the CSA networks. And when I talk about regional producers, I'm not just talking about CSAs. I really think we need a patchwork of systems laying on top of each other, especially around, you know, leveraging the, um, you know, parts of this business that are really hard for producers. You know, I'm really into food hubs and especially food hubs that work within a CSA system. And I think that's a great way to, to build and rebuild. But I'll be honest, it's, very difficult. And I say that from even having personal experience, you know, the book came out three months ago. I have been a member of our local neighborhood CSA for a really long time. And they were so excited about the book and know that I'm unfortunately probably the, me and my sister are pretty much the only people who are buying most of the products from their food hub is I'm trying to, you know, practice what I write about. And they had this period a few, starting last, last month, where they had, you know, it's like the three months where we're, unfortunately, you know, we're in New York, we can't have all year round access. So there's a summer system ends in November, then there's a winter three months. And then there's this awkward period where I have a struggle of figuring out where I'm getting my food between February and April. And they asked me point blank, if I would help give them an extra distribution spot in New York city. And I said, absolutely. You know, it's probably also mostly going to be my stuff for my sister's 25 bag pound of flour anyway. And it was on Valentine's Day. I got married a few months ago. So it was my first married Valentine's Day. And I was like, husband, I love you. We're going to have a great Valentine's Day. But I have this CSA distribution center also happening today. I'm not sure how many people are going to come. Not sure who's going to be there. I'm not sure when they're showing up. I'm not sure what our apartment's going to look like based on how much is going to be there. But we'll see how it goes. And I was so excited. I was like, I'm ready to do this, you know. Turned out they have a crazy guy working for them and they just simply never showed. Mm. And the farmer was freaking out and they now have been actually having to completely change what they actually been able to do for these next three months. And so it takes everyone working every day in the system by the hardest upstream uphill battles, David and Goliath, like to the max. But there are so many people who are excited about doing that and they all keep me optimistic. Mm -hmm. Can you define uh, what a um, public food sector is? Yeah. So, you know, it can 
be as kind of minimal or as expansive as it can be. The public food sector really just, you know, think about it like a, a buying arm of the government, right? It could work quite locally. It could work overlapping with credit systems or local municipalities or states. It could work federally. Um, you, you could say that, you know, not a public food sector, but an example of universal food access is what's happening in terms of public school lunches and breakfast. And obviously there's been a lot of debate around that, but, you know, in the pandemic, universal, there was universal public school meals for the first time. And that was a step towards that, you know, West Virginia, and Maine were both states in 2021 that added the right to food into their state constitutions, which is like another way to think about this. But a public food sector is really a way to think about how to make that work in reality. And it could, it's really just a department or it could be warehousing that's owned by the government, you know, to hold, hold food. It could be, you know, only used for emergency response in climate crisis, or it could look like how it looks in South America and other parts of the world where there are cafeterias where Everyone from all walks of life will go and have a great meal, and it's completely normal. It's completely part of their society. So it really, it could, it could be as expansive or, you know, as limited as we, as we mm -hmm. are. And you mentioned a couple of times in the book that you think food companies shouldn't be publicly traded. Can you talk a little bit about why that is, as well as about public benefit corporations and how they might be a step in the right direction? Yeah, absolutely. You know. Being publicly traded means that that company, its board, its owners are responsible to their shareholders. And that means that they have to have, by law, they always have to be trying at all their best to their ability, grow and profit and give returns back to their shareholders as much as possible. And well, you know, I'm not a software reporter, so I'm not going to talk about what that means for the tech world, although I think we've seen a lot of crazy things that have come out of that. But in the food world, we can only eat so much. We can only grow so much. And those constraints coupled with a mentality that you must continue to add margin or add return or grow or keep giving more and more dividends over time. And these many of these companies have been publicly traded for, you know, decades, it, it's created this completely unsustainable system where food is now, you know, having to be cut, right? Nutrition, health, climate, these are all corners that are being cut because there, at the end of the day, is the overall goal of simply profiting, simply gaining, giving as much back to their shareholders as possible. And it's, it's, it's really created a, a, a dynamic um, that's hurt hurt people across the supply chain, consumers, workers, pretty much everyone. You mentioned too with venture capital, the idea that that investor is planning their exit at the same time that they're coming in can only be damaging to the idea of creating a long-term source of foods. Absolutely. You know, I can't tell you how many times I had investors slapping me on the back saying, almost salivating, like, oh, it's like the early days of the internet, just telling me so how excited they were to profit, to get that exit. And let me tell you, most of those conversations were happening when they had just made their first investment or when they were just looking at the space and trying to figure out what they were investing in. And there was just this past decade in the food industry really took a turn into this like kind of late capitalistic bubble. But I can explain really how that happened and why. Essentially, in short, it's because a lot of these software investors in Silicon Valley had made a crazy amount of money. There was, all those funds rolled over, right? These funds typically roll over between three to five years, three or seven years. And um, that's why these investors are often looking for an exit, looking for a sale of their stake within three to five years, and they're looking for a significant return on that. So there was just this period where there's a lot of money going in, and they thought that they didn't understand there's only one stomach. They thought we could get, you know, a tech return, a tech multiple, a tech valuation off of these companies that just simply are not the same thing. And it's led to a lot of bankruptcies. It's led to a bubble bursting, and it's led to a lot of wasted time and resources when we simply don't have any time to waste. And what about public benefit corporations? Yes. yes. I 
think public benefit corporations are an answer to what I'm suggesting. And, you know, I, I've just spent a lot of time with Matt O'Hare of Vital Farms, um, which was pretty much the first food company to go public with that with that distinction. And it was extremely hard for them to get that to happen. So being a public benefit corporation means it's actually a specific tax designation that gives a founder or a board or investors the ability to, to, to push back on that need to only profit. And it gives them leverage against potential sale of a company that maybe wouldn't be to the right buyer. Or if investors want to go end up going public one day and they were saying private, but it also is a tool that's actually created for publicly traded companies to use to kind of take into this take this into consideration. Now, you know, Tyson is not a public benefit corporation, um, but again, there are more and more out there. ButcherBox is a benefit. Uh, it's, well, it's actually so a public benefit corp is like the strongest aspect of this, right? Um, there's also the B Corp certification run by B Labs, an independent organization. And that is also now gaining steam and has a similar amount of teeth. I think the legal tax designation is quite stronger personally, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny with the organization, the certifications that, which comes with that. And so there's very high standards that have to be met to make that, that designation to begin with. And it's growing a lot. You're, you're starting to see it on labels, even in the grocery stores. And the B Corp is, it's a different process to get it, right? It looked to me like it costs more and it's. Uh, yes, it's, it's completely different. And so ideally you'd be both right. Mm -hmm. And vital farms, for example, is a public benefit corp tax wise, but also has that B Corp certification. Obviously that does cost again, a lot of money. Um, but I think it, it, it was really important for them to do before they went public. Um, and, and Matt O'Hare said it was like pretty much the only thing he wanted to do because he was really worried about the long-term vision. Otherwise it's a, it's a way to ensure that the original mission hopefully can get there. It's a way to put your money where your mouth is because everyone is talking about climate, but no one is really making the actual major changes that we need. Mm -hmm. And one of the climate crisis side effects that I hadn't heard too much about before your book is the decrease in soil's capacity to store carbon as the, sto as the soil warms. Um, and it's kind of a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And you also mention at the same time that our food supply is becoming less nutritious. Can you talk about that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Climate change is hitting us from all angles, but the actual just heating of this planet makes crops less nutritious, lower levels of all the important nutrients that we want to see in our food to begin with. And it is completely reducing the potential of sequestering carbon in the soils. And so, you know, I want to be very specific in the book. I didn't use the word regenerative. I didn't go into the whole carbon, the decarbonization and, and, and sequestering in soil debate that much because there's a lot of science on both sides. I, there is no doubt of what farmers like Will Harris of White Oak, White Oak Pastures have done and how they've been able to completely re-energize the local economy around them and also rehabilitate soils that had been so severely degraded from monoculture and row crop farming over generations and generations. And while, you know, the there are studies that, you know, they have published about how much carbon has been put back in the soil. And you can see it, you know, teeming with life, as they say. At the end of the day, there's just so much we don't know about how that will long-term be stored. And that's why there's a lot of long-term questions that I have as a journalist that I'll be exploring, you know, throughout my work in the next few years, I'm sure, you know, around all these efforts around carbon credits and particularly selling the carbon credit future around soil health. And speaking of nutrition, at one point you interview Chef Dan Barber, who's doing some work on seeds, and you two discuss the relationship between nutrition and flavor. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So he really blew my mind with his barley uh, and back in 20, 2019 when it was first coming out and he was first kind of getting it that the breed kind of perfected. But really what he's learned through all of his work with seed breeders, regional seed breeders that are each trying to find specific strains or breeds that work in specific areas and then have, you know, again, a, a way to re-regionalize and, and kind of help this food economy flourish. They found out that nutrition is so deeply tied 
to how it's growing, but also to the flavor and the color and how it looked that, that all really, you know, is, is part of this. It's all a part of in different layers of an ecosystem really. And so think about that, right? His carrots have like triple or even more beta carotene than the typical grocery carrot. It looks completely differently. It also tastes completely differently. Industrial agriculture and, and seed consolidation, there's so much, so few people, uh, groups that are selling seeds anymore. It's stripped flavor and nutrition from our foods. And, you know, we all think that bananas don't have seeds anymore. And there's only one type of banana. And that's completely the opposite of the case. But, you know, right now, the alternative to the barley that, you know, he served me would be an organic barley and whole foods that pretty much would otherwise could even, you know, be fed to livestock, which it is what it is. But um, it's just, there's just really no differentiation or diversity within even sometimes the, you know, kind of premium organic parts of this industry. And that's because there's just been fewer and fewer seeds being saved and, 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 and bred naturally to, for flavor and health. They've been bred for quick growth and efficiency and as, as fast and cheap as possible and also easy to pick. Mm-hmm. You talk a bit about in different aspects of the book about the intellectual property around food, the idea that breeding stock of chickens or seeds or Monsanto Roundup Ready corn, all of that is somebody's intellectual property and I maybe adds to the fragility of our food system. Absolutely. I think about that so much, pretty much every day around the debate around lab grown or, or cellular agriculture or meat that is really here because it's about to start getting sold in grocery stores and restaurants within the next few months. But there is a small handful of a few investors that are making these investments in these startups solely because they think they will be the only ones to eventually have the intellectual property one day. And when you're trying to hoard those types of previously natural systems that were like a tale as old as time open sourced, it just, it's a money grab. It's a land grab. It's, well, it's a power grab. And that's that, that my, t- my chapter is, is called the lab grown power grab, lab grown power grab for that reason. Um, but it's not just, you know, it's not just in the lab grown meat world. It's obviously also in the, the plant-based on these synthetic biology alternatives. It's also in some of the new breeds that are out there and, and how, you know, there is 99% of our chicken only from two breeds to begin with in this country, which is such a mind blowing stat for me to think about. Would a right to food include some legislation about intellectual property that would protect people from access to food because somebody wants to just own it? I would love to see that. And I, th- in my conclusion, you know, I write about how if lab grown could become part of that public food sector, I think that could be an admirable way to actually scale this technology. Because right now there's, aside from this intellectual property debate, which it, it, it's hand in hand with an accessibility problem, because the same investors that are investing to own the intellectual property are also investing be, in a lot of the more like, you know, super high end products, the steaks, not the ground beefs. And they're often doing that because they think there'll be a higher price point and the bankers of the world will want to try this more than, you know, the average mom. And that's why there's also like insecurity and accessibility baked into how this is currently being built. And lab grown meat has had decades and decades of an open sourced history. And just in the past few years, there's been a rush and a race to really to, to, to own it for the future and a public food sector and working within that could be a great way to create local access and also, you know, work with other alternatives in a, in a broader system. I was on a few panels at South by Southwest this past weekend, and we did some really cool interviews around um, wastewater treatment plants and how they can use, you know, yeast for synthetic biology and essentially use fermentation to then create like a mycology, a mycelium, a fungi based 
ingredient, which is a protein that's going to pretty much help bring the cost down for almost all of these other alternatives. And at the same time, those plants can be co-located with other plants, right? Like a lab grown or, or the actual mycelium producer or the food producer or several different types of these alternatives that do need heat, clean water, but also these other ingredients. Hmm. Is there other technology or ideas at your recent conference that got you excited? Definitely the co-location was the, the most room because it was explained to me very specifically, right? Like a producer in LA or even a chicken producer, because chicken houses take a lot of energy, take a lot of heat. A chicken house plus a fungi producer could each work within the actual like LA wastewater treatment infrastructure, you know, and that could be then moved to Dallas, that could be moved to Omaha, that could be moved to, you know, Indianapolis. And I think that's a a clear way that, you know, infrastructure can be leveraged that's already existing and then work within that system that we have to Mm -hmm. work within. Raw deal is a mix of urgency about the need to course correct our food system and reality check about where we stand. Existing structures need to change, you say. Well, at the same time, there's just not time to start from scratch or burn it all down or do a hard reset on capitalism. How should the average eater balance potential paralysis from the existential nature of these crises with the need to act? Yeah, the balancing act is really hard. And I think there are good days and bad days. But the more we can engage, the more we can be angry and share that with politicians, with you know local foraging organizations, local CSAs, local grocery stores that aren't you know corporate owned or you know getting it ensnared in the Kroger and Albertsons merger that potentially is happening. The more we can do that, there's a sense of belonging and community that I think relieves a lot of anxiety that a lot of people think about when they think about how stressed it will be to get food in the future. And I think the real problem is that right now, the top corporations, the top meat packers are, you know, not throwing everything they've got to this problem. It is such a massive problem that we face. And they're sitting on billions and billions of dollars and barely pilot testing their way to making even remotely substantial goals or investments in testing things now. But we need to test things now because we pretty much have these next few years to work out the kinks and make these investments and make the big risks before the climate gets worse. Because 2030, we're already going to be having such significant problems that it's going to continue to exacerbate the inequality, the inequity, the accessibility problems and the pollution and health problems that we get from this food system. And so, you know, I think about the farm bill a lot because it's happening the debate's going on right now, and there's a lot of different types of folks that are trying to get in on it, but also trying to make it clear that this is funding for the next five years. And many, and including myself, would say that these are the most crucial five years we have left. Hmm. Wow. Well, that seems like a fitting place to wind up. I think that at the very least, probably everyone who's listening can think about what they're representative might be thinking about the farm bill and reach out and want do one small step in that way. I often think that people just get overwhelmed by the level of concern that's going in everything that we're doing right now. Yes. And I hear that for sure. <laughs> no. Yeah. But I think that you're, you know, the urgency about it was so palpable in your book and repeated and, and important. So I really appreciated that part of it. Chloe, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Your questions really just let me talk about everything I want to talk about. So I really appreciate it. They're really thoughtful. Oh, thank you. And I think that I probably had 20 questions more than I could have asked you. I feel like we didn't talk about lab-grown meat very much. I didn't even get to monopsony. (laughs) You teed me up and then I didn't even talk about monopsonies. Yeah. So there was a lot more to say. It's really such a deep well of really interesting topics and you've done a really great job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Really appreciate it. We've been listening to journalist and author Chloe Sorvino. Thank you for joining us today at Eat, Drink, Think. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to pick up your local edible magazine. You can find show notes for today's episode at ediblecommunities.com. 